And so I think the, the basic idea is that there are good ideas out there and they get started somewhere, but they may not be quite perfect at the beginning. And so they get passed around and refined and, and different people take it forward and shape it. They tailor it to a specific context, a, spe a specific market. They make an idea more affordable, more accessible to have a broader reach. And so that, that's the idea that we want to focus on, that we want to have these technology ideas and innovations um, be refined and have the broadest social impact as possible. And I also would like to focus in on the technology innovation because there are unique challenges um, to technology innovation. There's the expertise required, there's space that's required, financing that's a little bit different. So um, I know the, the group of social entrepreneurs and impact investors and all the other people who are here are interested in many different types of innovations. Um, but we, what we would like to do is focus in on that technology component here today. Um, so we'll start the conversation with this small group here. I would like to invite all of you to comment at any time and ask questions. Um, and then what we will do is break into a couple of small groups to have a little bit more focus of a conversation. What we would like to see is really have partnerships and, and new at least possibilities for people to work together come out of this. Um, we want to make it very um, active and that when we leave the doors it's not just we had a conversation that stays here but that there's something that we can carry forward. All right, so we'll turn it over to the speakers first. Um, can you can you both describe how your organizations are promoting innovations and how you how you go from an idea and have that scale and spread? So let's start with Vikas. Sure. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, so I, I work at Axion Venture Lab, uh, and uh, Venture Lab is a seed stage financial inclusion focused investment vehicle uh, that tries to support both through capital uh, and guidance what we think of as the most innovative financial inclusion companies in the world. Um, the, the, the bias that we come to uh, the kind of investing world with is that startups actually uh, are, are poised to be the most innovative um, um, kind of uh, players in the in the in the financial inclusion ecosystem, uh, that they're really at the cutting edge, um, that they're doing things that larger players have trouble doing, um, and that the the uh, startups are able to prove new ideas, uh, and then allow those ideas to kind of spread out um, ar ar around the ecosystem, uh, and and actually um, have multiplied multiplied impact. Um, so, like I said, we invest in these startups uh, the, because of some of, of what Rainey began to touch on. Um, you know, entrepreneurial ecosystems in a lot of the markets where we work tend to be underdeveloped. Um, a lot of the businesses that these startups, um, or the models that these startups are pursuing um, are uh, pre-investable, considered pre-investable by kind of conventional, even early stage venture investors. Uh, so we come in and we try to provide that investment capital as well as the support. So on the investment side, on the kind of prove new ideas side, um, we provide money. So we provide uh, anywhere between $100,000 and $500,000 to these companies. Um, uh, I'll talk more um, if it's interesting about what exactly we look for in, in businesses, but it starts with, with capital. Uh, we usually um, uh, invest with others. So um, we'll often lead a deal but bring in other impact or even just totally commercial investors um, so that you can get the benefit of a lot of different um, uh, minds at the table as well as um, more, more capital. Um, the other thing we do on the kind of prove new ideas piece is a very deep kind of portfolio engagement. So we have an operating partner in our, in our fund that focuses com uh, solely on uh, kind of uh, very targeted consulting assignments with our portfolio companies. So within a couple weeks after we've invested in a business, we've already identified what are some kind of core strategic issues that the business is facing, and then this kind of consulting SWAT team will go in and uh, and help uh, advise and fix fix these issues. On the kind of industry um, uh, insights piece, we also have an industry engagement function. 
So the idea is, you know, we're an impact investor. Axion is a massive not-for-profit. So we think returns can happen in a lot of different ways. And the way that, uh, you know, one of the most important ways is that this innovation, whether it's successful um, or not, uh, that, that knowledge, those new business plans, those learnings need to kind of ricochet through, through, the, through the ecosystem. So we have a totally separ a separate function called industry engagement that actually builds partnerships with uh, other entrepreneurs, with investors, with regulators, uh, with channel partners uh, to make sure that the learnings from these uh, startups, these innovations are being felt throughout, throughout the ecosystem. Um, so that's uh, what we do, how we engage. Um, um, we've invested in 19, 20 as of this week businesses around the world. Um, we invest in uh, uh, Africa, Asia, LATAM, um, and the U.S., primarily India and Asia, primarily East Africa and Africa, primarily Mexico and LATAM, and, uh, and, and, and the U.S., but uh, we're, we're open geographically. It's really about where the, uh, where the innovation is happening, where, where, the, where, the, where the teams are strongest. Um, so that's a quick, quick overview of what we do, and happy to, to talk more, more. Thanks. Yeah, it's okay to yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I come from a completely different perspective. I'm, uh, my background is uh, engineering technology. So I think uh, I would talk about uh, product innovation and a little bit about process innovation. Uh, I think while we have done innovation in the household cook stove space also, uh, I'll touch upon that uh, very briefly and then go on to see how we have done uh, products for the commercial cooking segment as well because the challenges in commercial cooking are completely different from the challenges in the household cooking space. Uh, so uh, the innovations that we have started in the household sp uh, space very long back, we started with mud stoves and all along our approach has been a very participatory discussion with users, what do you need uh, and then try to do it for them the way they need it. Uh, so we s so even if it was not fashionable, uh, we decided that we will stick to mud stoves uh, because what they wanted was uh, user response. I think has been consistent throughout India and I suspect throughout the world. What they will ask for would be uh, faster cooking, smokelessness, uh, you know, time saving. Time and again, whenever we have gone, this is the response that we have got. Uh, so what we said is. Uh, let them be comfortable in their own practices. Uh, I'm not looking for 50% efficiency, although I think I can design a stove for 50% efficiency. Let me do it at 25%, but give them all the conveniences that they are looking for and at the cost at which they can afford it. Uh, so we stuck to mud stoves. We stuck to stoves with, the, with chimney because air quality and smokelessness was important to them. Uh, uh, what we did was, uh, when we did this user need assessment, we did some kind of actually a mathematical modeling uh, where we looked at, uh, where actually we said that can we uh, call uh, your cook stove like a, a constant stirred reactor, CSTR in chemical engineering terms. Uh, we did that, we looked at uh, temperature inputs, we looked at temperature outputs, we looked at heat inputs, heat outputs. We looked at uh, where are the, where is the efficiency going, where are the wall losses, where is the chimney losses, etc. And then we said that with this baseline, uh, we did a model of that, a mathematical model which we had done out of that, a theoretical model of uh, how to design a cook stove. We tweaked that model a little bit by giving different inputs. And then we said that our goal should be to maximize heat transfer to the vessel, minimize heat, trans heat loss to the wall and to the surroundings and also minimize heat loss through chimney. So these were the targets that we set for ourselves. Uh, and then uh, we, uh, we said that let us look at uh, cleaner, uh, complete burning. That is the first thing, you know, you should not try, you should not lose heat because uh, some of your fuel is not completely burnt. Uh, and you should be able to transfer as much heat as possible uh, to the stove. So we looked at combustion efficiency and we looked at heat transfer efficiency. And we designed, actually we designed a product where we could have got 40% uh, efficiency. We brought down the efficiency to look at uh, user comfort. So that is our household cook stove model. Uh, 
but once we had this mathematical model where we understood wood burning uh, very scientifically we were able to design a whole lot of uh, stoves for different cooking applications so each time what we would do is we would feed in the user user requirement and then come up come up with uh, a design and then take that design to the field uh, test it out with people get their feedback and keep keep modifying the design until somebody says that yes i am happy with this performance the next step we would go back and say but uh, having cracked the performance stage we would go back to them and say how much are you can you are you willing to pay so that way we would again uh, look at the design look at the model to try to bring it make it a little bit low cost somewhere compromising partly air quality somewhere compromising on efficiency but make it a way make it uh, as user friendly and as affordable as possible that's what we have done in the cook stove space and in order to maximize efficiency uh, and user convenience uh, one what we had to do was we couldn't say use this one cook stove we have developed a range of cook stove designs uh, which could uh, which could work for uh, if you want to make tea a different stove if you want to make a cook on a flat plate a different stove if you want to cook do frying a different stove boiling different stove uh, so that way we were able to offer best efficiencies uh, for a wide variety of uh, cooking applications uh, of course people will ask us uh, people did ask us then i cannot afford to buy three stoves uh, so what is your solution so again we compromised and said that there is one stove which is we call a multi purpose stove it would do everything but not at the best possible option that i think is now our fastest selling uh, product which offers you flexibility and then again uh, there are families five member families there are 10 member families uh, then you have hotels restaurants where uh, 100 people eat some other places where 500 people eat uh, these are all different products within the same range of class of products that we have been able to develop and sell I can go on, but I thought I should have. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good start. <laughs> that's a really great start and introduction, and I, I think what what I'm hearing from both of you guys, coming from different perspectives, from Swati, what is the, how do you go from that engineering problem and bring users into it, and what does that process look like? And from Vikas, the the investment perspective, how do you look at a, a business and the potential for innovation and the innovation to scale? Um, I want to ask the audience here also if any of you guys have additional perspectives in addition to the entrepreneur, in addition to the investment perspective, for how you support the spread of innovation. You know, I'm a little confused as to where does uh, you know what constitutes invention, what uh, where does it become an innovation, and where does innovation become uh, plagiarism? All right. So mm -hmm. I would like to uh, sort of focus on uh, on defining all right what is innovation. All right, because we keep hearing. This word is probably the most bandied about word. We have used it a lot today. Everybody yes. claims to be an innovator. Yeah. And um, but nobody claims to be an inventor. There's very few. So, like for example, Steve Jobs was he an inventor? Was he an innovator? Uh, I don't know. I throw it open. Yeah, I, I think that's a. I think I think that needs to get uh, a little burned up as to what constitutes an innovation, and then you can talk in terms of you know. Impact investing and uh, you know dispersing innovation, uh, you know linkages and uh, all those kind of things. But what is innovation? I mean, what do you? It means something to me. It means, it means something. And and then I'll 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 go ahead and try to yeah. explain I, I to you. A question. I think it's a really good question. It's one that I don't think we will have time to fully address to define innovation. And I think innovation, as you said, will mean something different to every single person in the room. What I propose we do is to pull out this idea of plagiarism versus invention and innovation and, and bring that out because to get innovation and ideas to spread, there, there is some aspect of plagiarism and, and copying um, and replicating, replicating, which um, in, in some circles is not good, in some circles you want to replicate a good idea. So how, how do you all feel about this balance of how we structure 
and innovation ecosystem. I'm sorry, I'm going to continue to use that because otherwise I think we'll be here all day. How do we structure an innovation ecosystem so that we balance the idea of supporting new ideas, new inventions, and also provide opportunities for plagiarism and replication? Yeah, yeah I think maybe I can just, uh, uh, yes, on this idea of copying, I think in the context of uh, social impact, copying is totally fine. Uh, what I see the biggest challenge is the, the funding for innovation. The majority of uh, impact investors, uh, even the majority of the funders, when they fund, they, they look for people who have a beautiful uh, business plan uh, written often by consultants and which have a very nice uh, established uh, distribution network. Very often, those are not the people that... Um, as an example, but I'll turn it over to Vikas on, I guess, three ideas that I'm hearing from the discussion. One is the importance or role of copying to increase social impact, um, the, the issue of the level of funding for technology innovation, and also how to match the different skills um, in, you know, making a business plan, making a case for why your business is important versus the technology innovation and, and, and how you guys think about bringing those skills together. Uh, okay. Um, so so uh, in terms of replication, I, I, I don't know if it really matters to me whether, you know, what, what innovation for us is a, uh, is the ability to offer uh, a new service to an underserved customer, expand the, the, the breadth of services that they access today, um, make an existing service cheaper, um, uh, better for, for a customer. Uh, often those are ideas um, that have uh, um, been generated in other markets that are being applied to a new market. That's innovation for us. Uh, sometimes those are um, uh, uh, totally novel concepts that are applied uh, in, 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 a, in a new market. Um, usually not. Uh, usually um, uh, a, a startup is building on many other ideas, uh, tweaking concepts um, to, to make them better applied to a market. And I think that's, that makes, that's how it needs to be, uh, especially in the financial services sector. Nobody's uh, going to come up with a, uh, you know, a, a widget that um, is a totally new kind of uh, uh, financial product, I mean, I guess you could say blo um, blockchain or, you know, Bitcoin or something is a, is, a, is, a, is a new product, but it's still based on core kind of finance concepts that we, that we understand. So I think replication is, is good. I think it's, uh, and, and, um, and we do, a, we invest in a lot of models that have been replicated across markets. Um, in, in terms of uh, I, the, I, funding. the funding, the funding question, uh, we, we, uh, are a seed stage uh, investment uh, fund. Um, so we hope that we are doing our best to invest in businesses similar to the ones that you just described, sir, which were uh, companies that have done R&D. I mean, this is our explicit mandate. These are companies that have done their R&D, that have started to pilot a product and started to prove some product market fit, um, but are having trouble, they're stuck in this kind of valley of death or whatever you want to call it, are having trouble getting to the point where they can c c get real large kind of institutional investors. And that's where we step in. And we think it's more than just capital, but capital is a big part of it. Um, we're, 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 there's not a lot of other funds like us, frankly. Um, we think there needs to be more, and we're hopefully proving, uh, helping to prove a model for seed stage investment in impact. Um, uh, but we're not, I, 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 we don't care what the business plan looks like, because uh, business plans are almost always just made up anyway, right? Um, we care what the team looks like. We care whether uh, the product is innovative by our definition. We care whether it's related to financial services in some way. And we care what the team looks like. Um, that, and, and, if, and if we can check off those boxes, whether or not um, the business plan is in Calibri or Times New Roman, doesn't really matter to us. Um, the, 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 but that is not necessarily um, uh, uh, what, how, how all impact investors are thinking about it. And it's also not the panacea. I mean, there's, there's a big problem, even for us, 
which is that 99.9% .9 of businesses don't even get in front of us. There's many fantastic businesses here, and probably some of the ones that are sitting in this room, or uh, leaders of, of which are sitting in this room, that we've just never, we just haven't seen. Um, and we do our best to be very well networked in our target market, spend a lot of time on the ground, but there's a bit of a clubby aspect to this world that we want to break down, but that's kind of the fact right now, so we need to get more, more, more companies in front of us. The other problem is a lot of times the companies that do get in front of us aren't ready for our capital. Um, we think that there's room for and we're thinking about ways to get um, more quick, small grant funding to, um, uh, to these businesses that are, 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 you know, are not quite done with the R&D or have the R&D done but haven't had a chance to really pilot these businesses, prove some product market fit. Doesn't make sense for us to invest yet, but, but if we could uh, get them fifty to $100,000, provide mentorship, have, be incentivized by perhaps um, being able to invest in those businesses once they got through that kind of program, we think um, they, could, uh, they could really benefit from that and hopefully that would mean a lot more businesses get to the point where we can invest, and we're hoping, hoping all those businesses get to the point where much bigger impact investors and commercial investors can invest. And there was a, well, I've think, talked I enough. Think you've yeah. on it in, in terms of the, in terms uh, of the, um, the team, that you yeah. look at evaluating the team. And I think to build on this idea, one of the things that we're looking at at the Global Alliance is, I, I think th there is something about, there is value in a good business plan and a good proposal because it represents clarity of thinking and planning. Uh, but that's, of course, not the only thing in that there are ways to do a more in-depth um, analysis of a potential investment or a potential enterprise or entrepreneur yeah. I mean, that I'm are much more in-depth. Projections mm -hmm. are, we, we know projections are not, I mean, I probably shouldn't say this. <laughs> it's not, you're not, you don't have yeah. a mic in your hand right Yeah, exactly. so this, is, this part <laughs> isn't being recorded. Yeah, we know projections are, are, are invented. I mean, obviously, yeah, you need to think about where the business is going, mm -hmm. whether there's a big market there and whether you can fill it. But, um, you know, that, that, that's not what's really driving investment mm -hmm. decisions. And, and the role of capacity, if there's a very strong technical team and they need some more business skills, I think that's, that's an opportunity for a more targeted um, approach on capacity building. If there's a good... Um, business plan, but the technology isn't quite ready. I think that's another, a different approach. So on that note, I think that's a good segue back to Swati on this idea that you were talking about with you, s you have an idea, an engineering solution for, in your case, combustion, but it could be any kind of technology solution. Um, and balancing the technology and the performance with the usability, what the users want, and with the affordability. And you use the word compromise a few times. So I, I think it's clear we all need to compromise, but how about pushing beyond the compromises and actually getting perform higher performance and higher usability and adoption and the affordability? What, what, what does the pathway look like for that? So I will use another word now, which is transition. You start off with compromise. You get people, you know, because the first change which they have to make, very often uh, the cook stove would be the first, first big expenditure that a household or a commercial kitchen would have made on a product that is innovative. They would have made, you know, they would have made purchases on several other things. So initially, the the point always is that. It, uh, they want to reduce their risk. So you offer a slightly compromised, not so efficient, not so uh, this thing product. Once you have buy-in of the customer, you can always introduce a version two, which is costlier, which is superior. You have the credibility, you have the user, uh, you know, acknowledging that this person will offer me a good product, will offer me a good service. You ride on your reputation and then, well, that's what we're doing, then introduce version 2, version 3, which are superior, costlier products. But at the same time, we have to enable, through financing, etc., the affordability of a superior product. Because a superior product is necessarily, I think, usually costlier. And, and it's... Yeah. yeah. So at what point do you say, 
I will stop in a meeting and this is my version one and I will keep the features for version two. See, I would never stop innovating. Mm -hmm. At what I at what point do I launch a product or a stove into the market? Uh, that is a commercial decision that I have to take. It is not an R&D kind of a thing, you know. At what stage do I say is it it is ready for market? I don't think I am ever ready to say that this product is good enough to go and it will endure in the market over the next five or ten years. So somewhere when the user is comfortable and willing to buy, that is a stage I would introduce. But I would continue to constantly engage with user and as they, and our response has been that as they have experienced some benefits, they start asking for more. Uh, and we have to be prepared for that because at that point when I'm running a business, I cannot afford to take one, one year off to again develop version two of a product. So we always have to anticipate what the customer would would want and continue to do our R and D for version two, version three, etc. So that that I think transitions us into what we're planning for breaking up into small groups. The idea of challenges that Swati mentioned. When you're running a business, it's hard to go back and, and take the time to do that R&D. So that's one challenge that is being raised. What we'd like to do now is split into small groups and um, group it hopefully by organization type so that you guys can first talk about what common challenges you share and then come up with some ideas for how to address them, especially thinking about partnerships that you can create across the different groups um, in this room. So uh, what we'll let me, let's do a quick survey of who's in the room. Um, so how many people of you are entrepreneurs and social enterprises? Okay, that's about half. So let's have you guys go over there as one group. How many investors do we have here? Two, three, okay. Let's hold off on what we do with you guys. There are not that many of you in here. Um, how about uh, R&D groups, academic groups, government R&D, one? Two, three, okay. And then, what was the other category that we had? Or organizations that do incubation or capacity building or other innovation design idea support. Okay, so let's. Well, what, what about the people who didn't? Yeah, were there other people who didn't raise their hands? <laughs> that covered everyone. Is that everyone? Nice. Okay, so definitely enterprises in that corner and what you guys will be doing is talking about first pick the three main challenges and then come up with let's say three ideas for um, what you might want to do don't move yet um, and then the other groups let's have the innovation firms and Let's actually just split all, group all the others together, given the numbers. Um, it, was, it was probably about eight total. So let's do that. It'll be a little bit harder to have um, talking about common challenges, but, but in that group, look, about, look at how you might want to bridge the different categories in that group. And what we'll do is talk for 20 minutes. Uh, we have uh, large pieces of paper to capture some of the ideas um, and then we'll take the last 10 minutes of the session to, for each of the groups to share some of their ideas and invitations for future partnership and collaboration and get to lunch on time. <laughs> so um, after having an intense debate with the uh, <laughs> Um, entrepreneurs, a couple of challenges that we came across in terms of the innovations itself is that we find that it's challenging to find uh, ground connect and they feel that a lot of innovations end up happening in labs without um, a connect to the to the actual end users and so they're looking at how to overcome those challenges and would appreciate your inputs on those. Um, and uh, uh, they're, they're also saying in terms of uh, addressing in investors itself, they're saying that a lot of times investors um, lack sensitivity in terms of the, the, the timelines and they feel that the whole due diligence process gets lengthened and so they don't get the money when they need it. Um, and sometimes they say that investors seem to lack um, seem to lack empathy in the sense that um, they forget to ask the, the entrepreneur 
skills. Well, we'll come to the skills at some point, but that, that's another point altogether. No, but I mean, so th that was another point and this is another point. So they say that the empathy in the sense that where do I need the money to go to? You mentioned the example of where they wanted money for R&D, but they got money for marketing and so it was a disaster. Okay, all right. Um, and so um, they say that entrepreneurs themselves lack, uh, sorry, investors themselves lack the entrepreneurial streak um, and, and, and domain expertise. Uh, a lot of times they feel that they're more bankers and so they approach things in terms of a spreadsheet where, where they should be looking at it more from, from, from an entrepreneurial perspective. Uh, suggestions for the research and institutional uh, representatives. Uh, we would like to have a lot more um, problem statements that you could take up from either the ground level users and work on resource solutions for them or look at industry problem statements that could have resource solutions. Um, and there's also uh, a lot of research and development out there and there are products that can be useful to uh, various communities, but there's just so much red tape in accessing these technologies and commercializing them. So if there's ways in which R&D institutions can reduce the red tape, that would definitely help both communities. Uh, and also looking at financing across the supply chain, starting right from uh, of course, R&D and the enterprise, but also looking at distributors so that they have working capital to be able to carry goods and um, end consumer financing, perhaps through MFIs or other such instruments that allow them to purchase these equipments because a lot of the grassroots level people don't have uh, liquidity. Um, and in order to encourage perhaps uh, R&D between industry and research institutions, look at governmental or probably grant funding for partnerships between enterprises and R&D institutions. That sums it up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we had originally planned to have a little bit more back and forth, but given time, we're going to give the microphone over to this other group who is covering a wide spectrum of different types of groups together. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, hi. So, so we're, we're the, all the non-entrepreneurs, the rest of us, um, ta talking about you all and, and how you can be more successful and how hopefully we can or we can help, or, or actually it's, it's really about how, how we can better understand your, your world and, and your realities and, and serve you better, because that's why we all do our side of the, the, the work. Um, so I think a lot of the things that came up in the plenary part too was this whole challenge of going from being an innovator into a business person and, and taking going from the lab to the, to the, um, to the market. And so, so that's, that's a, ch a challenge because it's a different space that, that many uh, entrepreneurs or many in, in innovators, it's, it's new territory for them. And it's not necessarily the territory that they thought about being in or even have studied uh, and, or have experience in. So, so there are, um, uh, so there's skills that you might not have. Um, and, and so the, the, basically the, the, um, which, which can lead to some of these miscommunications and, and challenges of it being harder to raise finance, harder to make the right, to build the right, uh, relationships and get the support. So, so some of the, um, some of the, uh, solutions and, and ideas is is we we talked a lot about having this idea of a founding team that there is there is a core set of skills that it, an entrepreneur or that a new company needs which is there needs to be the technology the the product innovation there needs to be uh, um, the marketing ability to market and get out to a lot of people and there needs to be the the ability to raise finance and manage finance manage money so those are three skill sets that it's really hard for just one person to have all those those skill sets so it can be a founding team and this is something that um, um, that the innovator doesn't have to grow all those skills themselves. They can also look at bringing in a part of building out the team early on. So, so the, the other uh, opportunity is there are a lot of, of tools out there in the industry like Startup Wave that uh, IntelliCap launched last year. It's a free resource for entrepreneurs to develop skills that they might not have. Um, 
So that's something, and, and there are many other incubation acceleration programs that, that are available to entrepreneurs to build the skills. And the, uh, the third opportunity is we, we'd like to see the more case, case studies, case studies an example of success of where, bo both where entrepreneurs have made this transition to become uh, uh, from inventors to entrepreneurs, but also success of uh, where founding teams have been formed that have, have had the, because that, that has its own set of challenges, of course, working with other people, taking something you've worked really hard to invent and then bringing on new people to help market it. There, there's a whole other set of challenges, but it, it can go, um, go faster. So, but getting out kind of best practices and success stories around that could also help. Did anything else I missed? <laughs> And I, what I'm hearing from both groups is there's a, a, di a desire to better understand each other and motivations and perspectives and also to literally work together. So given that it's lunchtime, I hope all of you guys will, will, will come together and then continue all, a lot of these discussions and find potential partnerships over lunch. Thank you, everyone.